Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. The purpose of the code, and I tried to emphasize that yesterday, is to keep us safe. For some weird reason, and I'd love to understand why, people are willing to tolerate a higher risk on a boat than in their own home. And you think about a home as a lot of escape routes, windows, multiple doors, right? It's pretty good. Second story. I mean, there is exits in a home, quite a lot of them. House catches on fire, it's pretty bad, but you can jump through a window, break of some legs, but you're on ground and you're pretty much safe. How many doors do your boat have, or companionway, or hatches? And how many exit points do you have on your boat? And when you jump off your boat, are you in a safe place at that moment? So you sit back and you're wondering, why would the bar be much lower for a boat when it's actually the worst place to be? I mean, we're never in a safe place on a boat. You're not rarely tied at the dock. And even if you are, that's not sure. It's you're, you're close to it, but you're not on it. And the code in the marine world is there to protect us so that we don't have these horror stories. Because my point is, we're all pleasure boating. This is not a means to die. It's a means to simply enjoy ourselves, right? And we're not making a living on our boats. None of us are out there saying, well, I got to feed my family. So yeah, my fish boat is crazy, but hey, I got to put food on the table and I can't afford anything else and I'm going to make it work. Right? We're not doing this out of necessity, it's a pleasure boat. And so following the codes is utterly instrumental to have a predictable and safe experience on your boat. Do it right the first time. Having done thousands of electrical audits on boats, I can tell you that a lot of us are inclined to take cut corners to get the job done. Maybe dinner's almost going to be served. You have to leave the boat. It's getting late. The project's taking longer than it needs to. You're frustrated. You've got other things to worry about. You've got to go back to work. You've got to do something. You know, someone's reminding you that this is taking a lot more time than it should. And what happens is you tell yourself, I want to cut a corner now, but I'm going to remember to do it right later. The challenge and the problem with that is the later part never really materializes. And in the end, when I come on a boat, it's, it's a bloodbath. I rarely come on a boat and people are smiling when I leave. We go together through a well of despair, journey down through the bowels of unhappiness, come at the bottom, and then I tell them, well, there is a way to get yourself back to the top, but it's going to be painful, and it's a high amount of financial burden and time, and then we hug it out. It's almost a pep talk, and then we start slowly crawling our back to the land of normal. And the reason that happens is because the majority of people are just simply too busy, don't care, they don't have the right parts, they just want to get it done, and they want to get a sense of satisfaction. What I'm here doing today is I challenge all of us to not take shortcuts with electrical systems. It's sort of like if you're going to work on your brakes on your car, it would be a prime example of not cutting a corner on the brakes on your car. You know, if you're going to work on the brakes on your car, you're probably going to want to follow instructions, do it by the book, because it's the brakes on your car. And an electrical system is very similar. So first thing, uh, on a boat, whenever you're working on your boat or you're retrofitting and you're wondering, should I keep this wire or should I change it? I actually see boats from the 70s where household electricians probably wired the boat to AC. I've seen a bunch of boats from the 70s that have solid strand um, household AC wiring on the boat. Pretty rare. No builder would do that, or maybe they did, but not a common builder today. If you've got AC wiring on your boat, make sure that it doesn't feel like a hanger. Like if it's stiff like a hanger, you've got to get it out. There's no doubt about it. It's going to be painful, but it's just time. It's just time, so just take the time to do it and go through it. You want basically 
multi-strand wiring, right, as you see here. And notice how, how many strands are on this wire. If you looked at welding cable, welding cable of this size would have maybe 20 strands. It's basically 20 small copper wires like this. But a proper marine grade wiring is going to be very flexible and it's going to be made of thousands of these little, little tiny strands of wire. Makes that, because remember, boats are a vibration prone environment. And I remember being a kid, you do this enough with a, a hanger, you're going to be able to shear it off. Literally have a great cut without a pair of pliers. And over time, that can happen on a boat. And so hence why they need to be multi-strand. Question? Question is, and let me try to phrase, is AC wiring on a boat solid or not? Yes. It cannot be solid. Not on a boat. Black and white. Can't. This is a rule, it's sort of like the Ten Commandments. It's one of the ten. You cannot have a solid strand wire on your boat, period. If you do, and you'll see that, you can clearly tell what it is. First of all, it looks out of place. You're like, nah, that wire looks weird. It doesn't fit in. That's the first thing. And if you touch it, it's rigid like hell. And you just know. And generally that happens when someone decided to delegate a task to someone that was at a rate that was too good to be true. Hey, I can do this for you. I'm gonna go to Home Depot, buy a bunch of wiring, you know, save you a lot of money, give you a deal, you can pay me in beer, you know, maybe, we'll see, or maybe I can sleep on your boat for a night, and then give me shelter and I'll work on your boat. And honestly, you can't have that. You're gonna get in a world of hurt. So you gotta have multi-strand. The other thing too is about color coding. For some reason, there is a significant portion of the population that either is colorblind or chooses to be colorblind. <laughs> and those individuals believe that everything is context driven, meaning they'll always remember that, that all black cables, they remember what their purpose are because they know what it's connected to. And for them, they think that codes are stupid, clearly. I haven't met one yet, but I'd love to. I'd like to have a talk. Probably think it's stupid. And they'll wire all their boat with black wire everywhere. And they're like, well, listen, it's pretty obvious. It's connected to the positive post, so why do you need to have a different color for that? And that's true. Until you disconnect the item, and then you have two black wires, and you're looking at them, and you're like, where does what go where? And sometimes with AC wiring, you have three wires. I've seen AC wiring, three wires black. Because it's context driven. And they're right, a wire is a wire. Listen, if you have a memory that you will never ever forget, anything ever, yeah, that, that'd be true. But then you can't invite anyone to ever work on your boat. You can't really pass on your boat to another owner because they don't have your memory. They're not infused with your knowledge. And then it makes troubleshooting an absolute nightmare. If you remove a part on your boat, you gotta be completely paranoid because now you're, when you're gonna be reconnecting it, you're gonna be looking at the same color wire. Some of them don't even bother to put heat shrink on the, to color code them. And so you're just looking, everything's black. And to them, probably, they buy one reel of wire or they buy, and they think, why would I buy two reels of everything when I can buy one reel? And then that way, just wire the boat black. And believe it or not, that is very common. Very common on retrofits. There is a purpose for every single color, and it's the same, it just makes, takes the guesswork out of working on your boat. Here's a chart from ABYC of all the different colors. The ones that really matter to us as boaters is yellow or black is for DC ground, return negatives, right? And red is main power feeds. Those are probably the two most important ones. From there, all you, that's why your wiring harness on your engines, different colors, right, and all that stuff, all those colors are right here, right? You see that a lot of engines, for example, orange, like on my Catalina, they had that. Orange was the at meter to alternator, they had that. You'll see brown, you'll see that as well. Oil pressure, blue. But the real one when you're working on your boat is red, and I love yellow. Not black, yellow. Because here's why. In DC, 
Well, let's start with AC. Black in AC is death, right? It's death. You touch a black wire AC, you're, you're, you're off. You're going to the other side. You're going to the other side, it's done, right? There's no, you can't touch a hot AC wire, it's over. Because you're probably standing on the ground and you've got a great voltage potential and you're touching 120, 220, and that's it. You're, 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 you're off to the other side. So, that's pretty bad. And we all know that AC is dangerous. Not a lot of bravado with AC on boats. Not a lot of bravado. Most people, I would say, have a high, low risk tolerance with AC. Most people are cautious. The challenge is that if your boat is black on the DC, black on the DC is benign, it's ground. It's the most, it's the safest thing. It's like standing on earth. Like what's wrong with standing in a grass field or being in the water? It's pretty, it's safe place. And so you take black AC death, black DC is earth, and now the only way you can tell them apart is what they're connected to or their wire size. But the challenge is on some boats, the black AC can get up to gauge six wire, like a big generator. Some generators go to number four. So unless now you've got to have a rule in your mind, you're like, if it's a really big black, I'm pretty sure that I don't have a really large AC appliance on my boat, so it's got to be DC. But anywhere from easily number eight or number 10 up, then you're like, well, number 10, easy can be AC, it can also be DC, and then everything is context driven. What is it connected to? Is it part of a cable which has three wires on it and there's a black, white, and green? But then what gets even crazier is a lot of people buy only one reel of AC wiring and they wire all their DC stuff with AC wiring because they can't be bothered to buy DC wiring, duplex. How many downriggers water pumps, bilge pumps, I, countless DC appliances have been wired in AC wiring on a boat. Oh my God, it's not a hundred, it's thousands. Because they just have it and they're like, it's a wire, it works, and they're right, it does. Until you forgot what it was doing. Touching black DC is benign, touching black AC is death. Hence, why? I like to use yellow for DC. So in our trucks, in our fleets, all the wire we buy for DC is, guess what? It's simply yellow only. It's, why, why would I not make it easy for everyone and safe? Yeah, you would go, the question is, where would you grab these color-coded cables? You would go to a chandlery? Well, not so much cables, but the, yeah, the, the charts? The charts. Online? You can grab that online or you'll get it from my presentation. Yeah, ABYC has that. Yeah. Even, you know, it's funny, Western Marine actually, or West Marine has a lot of, they're really helping the do-it-yourself. There's a lot of stuff on even West Marine's website. They've got tons of information. Because, I mean, they're trying to feed the do-it-yourself market, right? A little bit like Home Depot. There's catalog, I think, like the page yeah. Catalog. Yeah, yeah, they're really helpful. I mean, they've got some really good stuff. I mean, they're trying to help people because, you know, I mean, all of us at one point have to do something on our boat. We all do. We, even if, you know, even if you've got a good trades, at one point you're going to be doing something on your boat. And you might as well do it right the first time. And so do it right the first time. Guess what on my boat? Do you think I have no wiring on my boat at all, ever? <laughs> no. <laughs> my boat is, I have wires of all different colors, all different sizes. I have connectors of all different sizes, all fuses. When I do a project on my own boat, I always choose the right wire, the right wire gauge, the right wire color, the right connector. Everything is there because I value my time. Time is the most precious thing I have in life, more than money. Time's always running out. There's nothing you can do to buy time other than not waste it. And that's why I always do it right the first time. Polarity on a bilge pump, right? We talked about it. Certain things will literally blow up if you reverse the polarity. And I've actually brought a bunch of multimeters and we'll take them out a little bit later. But it's absolutely essential, essential that you don't screw up polarity. And if you're going to work on your boat, and we're going to talk a little bit about multimeters in a little while, 
I highly recommend that you get used to measuring polarity on a wire. I don't even, I doubt myself constantly. Bravado, confidence have no place on electrical systems. None. When I connect two wires to an appliance, even if it's red and black, I take my multimeter out and I confirm because I don't want to damage the appliance. I always measure polarity. Right? I measure 12 volts and I want to have the right polarity. Red is 12 and if I had it wrong and I put black to black and red to red and suddenly I measure negative 12, I'm like, well, how the hell did that happen? But I never hope that it's right. I never assume that it's right. I always doubt myself. Doubt is a good thing with electrical systems. You want to have a lot of doubt. It makes you go slow, but it's so is walking a tightrope. You don't want to walk a tightrope with tons of bravado, misstep, fall over, you're like, well, that was, that didn't work out. Confidence, you don't want to have too much. You want to doubt yourself, go slowly. So polarity is absolutely essential. A lot of boats, obviously red is red for DC. A lot of us are going to have black. If you're rewiring something on your boat, you're changing something. You know, on my boat, Catalina did everything in black. But as I'm adding wire for anything, if I'm running a new wire to a new place, I'm running duplex, red, and yellow. Right? Duplex is two wires in one cable. Like for example, if you see a power cord extension, that's a triplex, right? It's got three wires in one cable. Duplex is two wires, and so you're running one cable that is made of two wires, right? So then that way you're not, you're, you don't have to buy a yellow wire and a red wire, you're buying duplex red to yellow. You can buy duplex red and black, but why would you when you can buy red and yellow? We talked about this. Black is the most dangerous. You have to stay away from black on AC. It will kill you. White is neutral and ground is ground. The neutral is the return path on an AC circuit. And the green wire is the second return path on an AC circuit. Sort of like the shoulder on a highway. If you don't have a shoulder on a highway, you should sort of freak out. Because if ever you have a breakdown, you're staying in the lane. And not everyone looks a car in front of them and stops. We see that all the time. If you don't pull out, you're going to get rear-ended. Some people just drive and they're just driving. And they're going to, whatever's in front of them, it's in front of them. That's how people die on the highways when the car stops right in the middle of the highway. You want a shoulder. The green wire is your shoulder. It's another path going back so that your circuit is completed. It's your redundant path. Because remember, your neutral is grounded somewhere, right, to be grounded. And so your ground is a path to ground, which is a path to neutral. And if you're, you've got an open neutral somewhere, you want to make sure that you have another path to ground. So it's redundancy. And that's why all these older homes that have two wire systems are strongly encouraged to go to three wire systems. And yesterday we had a question about generators. You know those little Honda generators? Well, the ground is useless. You plug it in, but there's no ground. There's no ground at all. You got to love the British. Honestly, you got to love them. I got I to gotta say, I would have loved to be in that room when that conversation happened. For sure, for sure, it's one of my top 10 places I want to go with a time machine. When they decided that zero was the biggest wire, and they were going to go with smaller numbers as they went up. You got to give it to them. That takes a lot of courage. <laughs> that is, whoever came up with zero being in the biggest wire in the room and made a decree will never have bigger than zero because zero is sort of the start. I mean, let's be honest. We know what zero is. And they decided that it's going to be actually opposite to convention. That takes a lot of courage. God, I wanted to be in that room. In North America, because we're so influenced obviously with the United States, working off the British system, wire gauges, the bigger the number, the smaller the wire. Which makes 
completely no sense. And then at one point you get to a zero gauge wire, which was probably the biggest wire they ever anticipated at that time, but it's not big enough anymore. <laughs> so then what happens? How do you go bigger than the biggest? Well, then you go one aught, one forward slash zero, two aught, two forward slash zero, three aught, three forward slash zero. So if the numbering system is confusing, it's not your fault. It's just not your fault. It's just not your fault. And we work with it because, you know, it's so commonplace. I mean, you just can't, all our technicians that come from Australia or New Zealand are like, what the, what is wrong with you guys? Why are we not talking about millimeters? Like, wouldn't that be easier? Just measure the diameter and let's just go with that. The bigger it is, the bigger the wire is. I'm like, yeah, but that's way too easy. You need to translate. <laughs> <laughs> so wire sizes, you can actually see this with 10 to 28, but this 10 goes 8, 6, 4, 2, 0, 1 aught, 2 aught, 3 aught, 4 aught, and 4 aught is not the end. I mean, that's just what's reasonable on a boat. It's about the size of a thumb, right? Inverters are going to be generally wired on 2 aught or 4 aught. A 2,000 watt inverter is about 2 aught. A 3,000 watt inverter is a 4 aught. And then when it gets bigger than that, then we start running parallel four aughts, like a 5,000 watt inverter, we're gonna run double four aughts because we have more amperage going through that wire, okay? So the smaller the wire, the thicker the wire, okay? From here to there. You had a question before. The reason why you size for a large wire is that you want that wire to not overheat for carrying those amps, right? And that's how they rate a wire. So for example, in um, 14 gauge wire for AC, that's pretty much how all our ohms are wired. 14-3, gauge 14 wire, three wires, hot, neutral, ground. So it's called a cable, triplex, 14-3, but it's made of three individual wires. That wire is 15 amps. You can run that wire at 15 amps, no problem, without that wire overheating, okay? Now there's other, con constraints. Is, is it running through an engine room? Is it going to be wired in a bundle? There's a lot of variables that affect wire size, but if you're looking at ampacity alone, a gauge 14 wire can handle 15 amps continuous, no problem. So as you install larger and larger appliances on your boat, one of the variables we choose for choosing the wire is the ampacity table. Okay? And it's not the only one, but it's one of them. Okay, and we're going to look at wires that have more amperage going through them than they can handle, and that's where those wire bundles, and you hear those stories, it happens, happens all the time, happens right here in the summer, you hear about boat fires, I get called on all the time, I get to see them for surveys, or retrofits, like fixing the boat, and generally it's because of a dead short, and the wire was running more amperage than it could handle, and it caught on fire, and then the whole bundle caught on fire, and then until the battery switch was disconnected, you know, there was a lot of damage on the boat or the whole boat went down. Now, the other variable that you choose a wire on is not only ampacity, but voltage drop. And that's why in Europe they did 220 and in North America they did 120. But at 12 volts, remember what we said at the beginning of this presentation. I emphasize that a full battery is 12.6, and a half empty battery at 12 volts is 12.2. 0.4 volts. That's not a lot of margin, right? That's not a lot of margin. That's a pretty tight, that's not a, there's, there's not much there. So when you're running AC, DC wiring on your boat and you're going from your battery banks that are at the aft of the boat and you're running a windlass at the bow of the boat or your uh, nav light on top of a mast is connected to the battery bank, you're having some crazy wire runs on a boat. And certain appliances through ABYC are going to say minimum of 3% voltage drop. So it's got to be 3% or better. And some are going to be 10% or better. But you don't want a wire to be so long that by the time you get to the appliance, you've lost so much voltage that the appliance won't work when the batteries are at 50% of capacity. Or God forbid, maybe for whatever reason, now you're at 11.8 on your battery bank. You're at 25% of capacity, but you got to run it. And if you have large voltage drop, then those appliances, imagine your anchor light stops working at 11.8. That would be disconcerting, right? At 11.8, I lose my nav lights. 
well, that would be pretty serious. I mean, you don't want your nav lights to stop working at 11.8 volts on your batteries. But if you've got undersized wires and it's a hell of a run, maybe it gets to the, by the time it gets to the appliance, it's only 11 volts, 10.5. And then suddenly that appliance load doesn't work. And now your nav lights don't work when you have low voltage. Hence why nav lights are a 3% voltage drop. Because you want to minimize the voltage drop on the run from your batteries to the appliance. <coughs> Longer the wire, the more the resistance. Right? Result of voltage drop is devices won't work. And the way to offset that voltage drop is by getting a larger wire. Hence why, when I do an install, well, I don't work anymore on boats, I just provide guidance, but our team does, we always err on the side of caution. We're not going to do something to the minimum because it's a waste of my time, the owner's time. I'm always going to go a size bigger. I always play safe and I'm always going to do it through the calculation. And Blue Seas, for example, a really good company out of Bellingham in Washington State has an app. You can literally in include what's my wire length? Is it going to be an intermittent or fixed load? Is it going to go through an engine room? You can put all those variables in and it's going to tell you what your voltage drop is going to be and what the impacity of the cable is and it's going to tell you what cable you should choose for that application. So you don't even need to use a table anymore. You can actually figure it out on an app on your phone. This is the table. Blue Seas did it. It's a great, because they're combining both voltage drop and ampacity on this table. ABYC has one that's just voltage drop and then ampacity, and you're supposed to choose the bigger of the two. Here, they're actually made both. So whoever, kudos to whoever did that. I mean, it's just, it's even beautiful. <laughs> Honestly, like who's, I mean, you look at that, you're like, whoever brought that to the boss, he was like so proud of himself or herself. I'm like, I did it. Can I go home now for a week? <laughs> I'm like, that's just amazing. Look, non-critical loads, 10%. Critical loads, 3%. The length of cable, total run, right? Not just going there, but coming back. And it's not like, oh yeah, my windlass is my batteries are amidship, my batteries are forward, it's 15 feet because I have a 30 foot boat. No, it's the path the wire takes to get there. Because as we know, there's no direct path between anything on a boat. Well, there could be, but you'd live in a rat's nest. It'd be like Southeast Asia, right? Like, I traveled there recently and I mean, the wiring there is just like, you need to take a chill pill. You need to go like, it's okay, it's not home, it's gonna be fine stay away. But in our boats, we're wiring wires everywhere, right? To get from A to B, you might, it's way longer than the direct distance between those two points. It might be 15 feet direct, but it might take you 30 feet to get there and then 30 feet back, right? So you need to calculate the overall. And if you miss the back, your wire length is going to be, wire size is going to be completely back, wrong. So you absolutely always need to go what is the length of the cable going to, for example, my nav light anchor light, and then from the anchor light back. So you always got to do twice, going and back. And that's the length of the conductor or the wire, circuit length, okay? Pretty much you can see everything, the biggest wire gauge you can do is four odd on a boat. And then bigger than that, then we start doubling them up. On the large inverters, we'll start having double four odd. This is an example of an anchor light. Right? So the battery's right here, and you've got to go all the way over here and back. So you got 10 foot at the bottom, 40 foot, but then 40 foot down plus 10, you got a 100 foot run. And again, you look at this and you say, oh, it's a critical load. So you come down over here, 40 feet, right? You know it's a 5 amp load, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, 100 feet. Sorry, all the way, sorry, my bad. 100 feet. 5 amp load, yeah, at least 6, at least 6, yeah. Now, anchor lights don't draw 5, that's why they're not as big, right? An anchor light's 1 amp, right? 2 amps. Now, LED lights are like 0.1 amp, right? That's why also, think about this, it's also why it's always easy retrofit LED lights instead of uh, halogen bulbs, for example, or incandescent, right? You don't have to worry because you're doing a fraction of what it was. Like if you've got a halogen bulb, it's like one and a half, two amps per bulb at, 24, at 12. 
So you change that out to an LED bulb, you're at one-ninth of that number. Right? So the wire is a huge overkill. But you're not gonna make, you're not gonna remove the wire because it's too big, because it's not worth your time. But you never have to worry about going to LED to replace an incandescent bulb or a halogen bulb because it's it's a much, it's a fraction of the load. Well, there's a list of critical would be like, for example, nav lights. Uh, VHF radio would be critical. Non-critical would be certain things that you don't care, like maybe a water pump. Right? Bilge pump is gonna be 3%. So things, there's a whole list in ABYC, they've divided it up. Things that you really care about, things that don't matter. Cabin like light. Cabin light, 10%. That's a really good example. Bilge pump is three. Nav light's three. Anchor light, three. Right? VHF, three. Things that you absolutely need. And I know most of us think that we need everything on our boat, but we don't really need everything. We just like to think that we do, but we don't need everything on our boat. So here, the example they're doing, non-critical, would give you 12. Fuses. What's the purpose of a fuse or a circuit breaker on a boat? It's the means by which we protect the wire from having too much current. Okay, does that make sense? I'm just going to show you a quick video about uh, the importance of fuse size, no fuses and fuse location, okay? So here we're gonna create a short circuit and we've got a fuse close to the battery. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, a fuse close to the battery? Good thing. Good thing. It's the start of the circuit, right? Think about our homes. The circuit breaker panel in your home is not for convenience. It's a coincidence that it's convenient. It's there because it's the start of all your electrical circuits. Gauge 14 wire. This is where we're going to cause a short, and that's a, la a light. What happens when you cause a dead short downstream of a fuse? Some sparks, same shot, light goes off, right? So we have a fuse at the beginning of the circuit, we've got a light, and we had a dead short. All good. What happened to the fuse? She blew, she blew right? So a fuse is gone. So now what happens was it became an open circuit, right? Remember what we talked about, that light, it has a resistance. That's why there's a limited amount of amps that goes <coughs> down positive back to the negative, okay? This is a typical install, VHF radio, fuse only near the appliance, okay? Got a, we've got a positive wire, negative wire, coming down, notice there's no fuses yet. No fuses yet. We've got a short before the fuse. Could have been anywhere. Here's the light. What happens? Wow. 12 volts. That's a gauge 14 wire. Honestly, from here, from this wall to the first table, the cloud of smoke was probably so opaque, it was over sort of two doors wide at least, maybe almost a barn door, garage door wide, not garage, but between the three doors, French doors, three French doors wide, completely opaque, you couldn't see through it, it was absolutely crazy. That's two feet, three feet of wire gauge 14 having a dead short. Trust me, you've got way more than three feet of 14 gauge wire on your boat that can dead short. If it happens in a wire bundle, you hear those stories, people are at the back of their boat, forget running your VHF radio. Like, it's never gonna happen. Like, you can't go down and operate a VHF radio in that dead short. And when they get off the boat, I've heard stories, the, the amount of damage that it causes to your lungs. I had it happen to a boater, talk to me at the boat show, it's been three years. He has literally heart, like uh, lung problems. He had his generator caught on fire. And uh, it was insane. Insane. Three years later, he's having tons of breathing problems from breathing all that wire jacket that got melted when his generator caused a short. So it's real, okay? It's not a joke. And that circuit, by the way, did the fuse blow? No. 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 Fuse was intact because the short happened before the fuse. 
So fuse location is not a joke. It's not like, oh, well, you know, I'm pretty good, I've got it. Wiring, it's like having a tiny chain link and the last four feet of chain link to your chain, you go the right size. It doesn't matter what you do that's right, it's what you do that isn't right. What's wrong is the problem. Being right for a foot and being wrong for 50 ain't good enough. Question. So the question is, how do you get to fuse a, batter, uh, a fuse a circuit at the battery? As you go forward from the battery, every single trunk circuit or big circuit has to be individually fused. You'll have the fuse, for example, from your battery, it's going to go to maybe some sort of fuse, and then from that, it's going to go on a large wire to your DC panel. That fuse might be 50 amps because it's a gauge 8 wire, let's say. And so that segment is an aggregate fuse for that trunk line from the battery to the panel. From the panel, then you've got individual branch circuits. Each individual one is going to be fused. I don't care if they're in a bundle. I don't care if there's 100. I don't care if there's 10. I don't care if there's 1,000. Every single wire that's connected to a source of power has to be fused. That's how it is on land. If someone didn't do that on land, it's criminal. It's literally criminal. It's not a slap on the wrist. Something happens, there is maximum liability. Can't do it. You'd be fired, you're dro you lose your job, you're, it's, it's criminal. On a boat, it's a choice. And it's a choice that is badly chosen constantly. That's the crazy part. And unrelated, we complain that boats are unreliable. We don't like that, you know, we, the risk tolerance. But, you know, boaters, as boaters, we have that decision. That's the problem with a voluntary code. You have to choose what is your risk tolerance. And like I said yesterday, when you buy a boat, a used boat, you don't buy just a used boat. You're buying the owner, the previous owner's risk tolerance is as important as the boat you buy. If that owner was a MacGyver and you're not a MacGyver, you're in a world of hurt. Now, if you're two MacGyvers and you're twins, hey, no problem. They don't care about safety. You don't care about safety. You're both match made in heaven. But you're always buying the previous owner's risk tolerance. Okay? Sometimes you'll have a circuit breaker at the beginning of the line and you'll have a fuse at the appliance, and that would be one way. You could have a fuse at the beginning of the line if that fuse is exactly what the appliance wants, you can have just one fuse for the wire and the appliance. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You can do that. Like for example, fuse blocks would be an example. You can install a fuse block. That fuse is exactly what you want. Like on my boat, I don't install fuses ever at the appliance. If whenever it hits a fuse block, I try to aggregate all my fuse blocks in one central location and the whole length of wire from that moment on to the appliance is on the fuse that the manufacturer recommended for the appliance. And it also protects both my wire and the appliance. For example, because I don't, on my boat, my circuit breaker panel would be a standing room circuit breaker panel, if you had to see it. That's how many circuits I have on my boat. Because I'm crazy. I mean, I love stuff and I got tons of stuff and my boat has more stuff than you can ever imagine. But that's because, you know, it's me. So my circuit breaker panel can't have all those circuits. So I don't turn, I don't have a, a circuit breaker for radar, a circuit breaker for chart plot, a circuit breaker for VHF, a circuit breaker for depth sounder, a circuit breaker for AIS, a circuit breaker for like my second chart plot or my second depth sounder. Like I, like I can't, can you imagine? It'd be a standing room like on a Swan 75, I rewired a whole Swan 25. Now that was a standing room DC panel. That's the type of DC panel I need on my boat, but I've got a 36 foot sailboat and I don't have a Swan 75. So I have basically distribution points. I turn electronics and it goes to fuse block and that fuse block has six or seven or eight circuits and it energizes my nav equipment. Same thing with lights. I'll have a bunch of lights, but I'll have individual lights off another fuse block. I'll have, you know, cabin lights, I'll have headlights. And so I basically, basically like a bit like a tree. You have a big trunk line, other big branches, and then from branches share out to more branches. And that's pretty common on most boats. It's very rare that you're going to have a boat that's going to have an individual breaker for every single DC appliance that you have on your boat. Yeah, the question is, if you have, let's say, a boat that has a circuit breaker for every single DC appliance on your boat, then you would be able to install only appliance fuses at the end or near the appliance, 
and all of your wiring would be protected by the circuit breakers at the beginning of the circuit. But that is a big, big if. The question is, with DC appliances, are the tolerances tight for fusing? Absolutely. Manufacturers don't say, I need a 5 to 10 amp fuse. They're going to say, I want 7 amps. They're going to give you literally an amp. They're going to say, I want a 10 amp fuse. I want a 4 amp fuse. I want a 2 amp fuse. You won't be able to find a circuit breaker at DC that gives you that level of granularity. You can't. It doesn't exist. So you end up having to install the fuse they, that they supplied or that you provide to at least protect the equipment. Now you could protect it at the beginning of the circuit if you don't have a circuit breaker, right? And that's fine. Or you can do it at the appliance, but then you need one for the line as well. The further you move a fuse for the appliance, closer to the appliance, you need a fuse at the beginning of the circuit for the wire. In to the breaker. Well, the breaker is the start, and the fuse is at the end of the appliance. So you'll, on a lot of circuits, you'll have two fuses, or a circuit breaker and a fuse, one for the wire and one for the appliance. You can combine both together at the beginning, right? You can, but you're not going to be able to find a circuit breaker for that because it's too granular in a lot of cases. So if you've got, for example, lighting is, question is, I have a, 10 lights on a circuit to a breaker. Does each light need to be fused? Well, it depends. It depends on what is the maximum rated ampacity that that light is able to take. If, for example, each of those lights say, I'm going to need only 0.5 amps to run, but I cannot have more than 0.2, more than 2 amps going through, you can't have a 10 amp breaker feeding 20 amps or 20 amp breaker feeding all those lights if the maximum capacity of one light is too much. You can't. Now, in most cases, that's not the case. Lights, when they burn out, they sort of die and they die with them. There's no, like, the limitation for a light is generally the wire going into it. So, for example, Catalina, again, most boats, old lights, pot lights, you know, the wiring inside would be the limiting factor. So if they were wired for 14 gauge inside of the light, that whole circuit could be fused with a 15 amp circuit. Because every wire in that circuit is able to handle 15 amps. So most cases, most cases, 99% of the time, lighting circuits are parallel, right? So you have multiple, you turn on a switch and a lot of lights come on. That's okay, they're in parallel and the wiring inside of the fixture is able to handle a lot more ampacity than the rating or the amps of the light. Like for example, my fixtures of my Catalina were all 14 gauge light wires inside, but each light only drew an amp. So my breaker on my panel could be 10 amps, the lights can all handle 15, and each lamp only draws one amp. So I'm fine. There's not a lot of circuits that are parallel on a boat, right? There's not a lot. There's not a lot. Lights are one of them, because otherwise you'd have literally a single switch for every single light on your boat, and that would be crazy. I mean, your panel would be the size of a door. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so this is the good one here, because this is, well, we were talking a little bit earlier. You got a big fuse at the beginning of the circuit, which people always tell me, oh, I've got a fuse at the battery, I don't need fuses anywhere else. A smaller fuse when the wire drops, and we're gonna create a short, Okay, there's a fuse right here that we can't see, and there's a fuse here. Which fuse blue? The little, the little one or the big one? The yeah. Okay, now, this is probably one of the most popular misconceptions that I hear all the time, is people tell me, Jeff, I have a fuse on my battery. I don't need a fuse anywhere else in my circuit. I hear this all the time. Boat shows, a lot of people like to sort of debate and argue and prove their points and like I don't need fuses on my boat because I have one at the beginning of the circuit. I'm like well if every wire on your boat was the exact same size and as big as the first wire that connected that fuse you'd be right and if every appliance would be able to tolerate that amperage you'd also be right but those are two big conditions that never happen on a boat so we're really talking about theoretical situations that never have happened ever 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 
because nobody's wiring a whole boat in 2 watt. And not every single appliance can take 2 watt amperage, which is like 300 amps. Right? I mean, what kind of boat would that be? That'd be sort of, that's a theoretical boat, but it ain't a real boat. So what happens now if you've got two wire sizes, but you don't have a small fuse when you hit a smaller wire? So you've got a big wire, big fuse. Smaller wire, changes size, now no fuse. You got a dead short on the small wire, what happens? That's exactly right. <laughs> Did the big fuse blow? No, it's 300 amps. It's 2 watt wiring, 300 amp fuse. That was gauge 14 wire. Gauge 14 wire, 15 amp maximum capacity. No fuse there. The wire can only take 15. Obviously it can take 20. It's probably getting warm, but at one point 15 is what's reasonable. And at one point, it would have been cool, I should have put a clamp on meter. See how, how many amps did it take until it blew? That would have been a good one. But the wire, so the wire was fused. Literally, it was fused, but it was the wrong fuse, right? Fusing a wire is not good enough. Putting a 400 amp fuse, or like, I'm no joke, this is a true story. Literally putting, for example, I've seen this, where people are putting, like you've seen this in pictures probably, a coin to replace a circuit breaker. Right? That happens. It's not, people don't make it up. Well, putting a coin to replace a circuit breaker, that's not a fuse. That is a dead short. It's, it's a replacement. You're basically bypassing the circuit breaker, but it doesn't certainly replace it. And so if you've got a 300 amp fuse on a 14 gauge wire, that fuse will never blow. You'll never have to replace the fuse, but the boat. <laughs> right? But the boat. So it's really important to remember to always worry about fusing both the wire and the appliance and under certain circumstances you can do both with one device or one fuse at the beginning if that fuse at the beginning is going to give what the appliance wants and what the wire wants, right? On new builds and stuff like that, it's generally a circuit breaker for the wire and a fuse for the appliance. They're going to do it like that. But then you got to chase the fuse. you got to know where that is, right? Because the breaker's on and off, but your VHF doesn't work. And sometimes what they do, the VHF, you know, might, the wire might be this long, and the fuse is buried way deep, and you're pulling up the VHF, and you don't have power. You're like, my breaker's on. There's power on the other side of the breaker, and I don't have power there. Where the hell is the fuse? And then you got to look for the fuse, right? And that's time-consuming, okay? So basically, you size a fuse to handle both the load and the wire gauge. And you don't want use in stripping. The point was you generally have, the manufacturers figure that number out. But if you don't know, generally you give yourself about 25%. Like if, for example, if I'm fusing a battery charger that's a 40 amp battery charger, I'm going to fuse a circuit for 50 amps. I'm going to make sure that the wiring can handle 50 amps. And I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put a 50 amp fuse in that circuit so that the battery charger never has nuisance tripping. You want to make sure that you protect the positive energized post on a fuse. You see a lot of times with fuse blocks, the cover's off and then you've got exposed positive connections. Any positive connection on your boat should be capped because if you ever accidentally touch the fuel tank, a fuel filter that's metal to a positive post, and you're doing it on the battery side, you're gonna have a dead short. So you always put a cap on all positive circuits. Same thing with, for example, on all our alternators, or especially in all alternators, we should have a positive battery cap on all of them. You know, a little cover. They're like $5, $2. They're, you see them in our cars. You open the hood of the car, all the connections at the batteries have a little cap on there. And generally, they're peeled over, not put back, right? Because people find them annoying. Always carry a spare fuse and choose a thermal circuit breaker recommended by the manufacturer, right? Use as a switch. A lot of people use circuit breakers as switches for on and off. They're convenient, right? That's what panels are, right? They're circuit, break circuit breaker and it's also a way for you to disconnect 
or connect a load to an appliance. We don't do that in our homes. Nobody's going to turn on the bathroom lights by going down in the basement and turning it down on there. But on a boat, a lot of cases, there's not another switch further down free. Like we'll start your nav and you'll have a radar breaker. It's radar breaker power and there's not a radar switch later on. That both energizes the device and powers on. There's not a secondary switch later on because our breaker panels are not bowels of a boat. Generally, they're not that far unless you've got a mega yacht and then everything's down in the engine room and then yes, you'll have other switches later on. But most of us are gonna have everything happen at the DC or AC panel. 